Good afternoon, good evening, good day, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I would. Uh, it's a shame we're not all in a physical room. If we were all in a physical room, it'd be much nicer to uh, recognize a few faces and uh, get a get a real sense of uh, who you all are. Uh, it's not a request that you all turn on your cameras, but uh, I won't be unhappy if you do. Um, with apologies uh, to some of my uh, colleagues uh, who have uh, here in New York who've heard me say this before, and and for any of you who might have been in the uh, who have might might have been in the community of practice last week, um, I'll, I'll repeat myself. So apologies for that. But for all of you that uh, I haven't met yet, uh, in particular working in secretariats, working in resident coordinator offices, working with agencies. Um, let me just say a couple of words, uh, let you know a little bit about uh, about who I am. Uh, so my name is Brian Williams. Uh, I ran the PBF from 2010 uh, to 2015. Uh, it was different then. Uh, it was much more of a, a kind of uh, startup operation. Um, the few colleagues uh, uh, here in New York and around the world uh, were part of that in the beginning. Uh, and, uh, and I've been lucky to do some other stuff and, and now lucky to be back. Uh, it's great to see how it's evolved. Uh, some of the core processes, I think, that uh, and core objectives and sort of vision we had, I think, stayed uh, stayed true. Uh, it's become a lot more professional. It's become a lot bigger. Uh, it's wonderful to see the enthusiasm that um, the whole system uh, and many of our development partners and 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 partner countries, governments, uh, civil society, the, the enthusiasm they have for peace building has grown tremendously. And I think. Um, I would say after three weeks or however long it's been, I, my biggest reflection is that in those earlier years, you know, to talk about conflict prevention straight up was not always easy. We we had to talk about, uh, uh, you know, peace building in the immediate post-conflict period. And there was a lot of emphasis on the peace agreement first, and then we do the peace building after. And, you know, the enabling environment for all that has shifted tremendously. And um, now uh, we can work in many more country settings where there is perhaps not a classic peace agreement and then signature. Uh, we can work in many settings where prevention is what we're after, where there's an agreement by different kinds of different constellations of partners that there are risks uh, around violence and conflict that we should be working at. And a lot of that has to do with the work of PBSO, not just the Peace Building Fund, one instrument, of course, a critical one, the PBF, but PBSO more broadly, the partnership with the World Bank, um, and all the good work that's been done on the ground. So it's it's really fascinating to see. And I just spent the last couple of days last week in Montreux with uh, about 60 resident coordinators, probably most of the resident coordinators that you all work with were there. And I got to talk to most of them or many of them. Uh, and we heard a presentation around the Secretary General's new common agenda uh, where human rights and, and prevention was really at the center of it. So uh, a fellow named Volker, Volker Turk in the Secretary General's office presented to the meeting and, you know, his emphasis was, yes. on, his emphasis was on the social contract and the need in countries uh, to continue to work on a social contract that results in greater equality, that results in greater protection of human rights and results in greater development. Um, so it's really an exciting time, I think, uh, to be working uh, in the Peace Building Fund because there's there's so much uh, more potential work uh, we can do. If uh, if if me and, and colleagues in New York can do our side of the bargain and, and raise the resources uh, so that you folks uh, can do the programming out in, in, in country level, I think there's there's really a lot of potential out there. Uh, in the intervening years, I was lucky enough to be a resident coordinator myself. So I was an RC out in uh, uh, out in Albania. Uh, so uh, learned a lot about uh, what the world looks like from an RC perspective. Um, uh, so when we get into the discussions that inevitably will follow around headquarters and field and so on, um, uh, I understand. Uh, I've been there and don't hesitate to call on uh, any of us in New York, but but me also if we can help uh, find ways uh, uh, that make sure the, the projects are being as successful as possible. Um, I also spent a year in DCO. Uh, I came back from Albania uh, a year ago and, and spent a year in DCO working essentially on cooperation frameworks and CCAs. Uh, and I do think there's an awful lot of potential uh, for integrating even more uh, with those instruments because it's absolutely central to what DCO is encouraging 
that one of the ways that cooperation frameworks are different from the old UNDAF is that they are looking at issues that UNDAFs didn't look at so much, and amongst those uh, is conflict prevention. Um, you know, a lot more work on conflict analysis and connecting conflict analysis work into CCAs. So there's a lot of exciting opportunities uh, from there too. Uh, in terms of priorities uh, uh, going forward, uh, you know, from now until the end of the year, uh, it will be a big push uh, on continuing uh, programming. Um, you know, the it all needs to work together in sync. Uh, we need to be demonstrating our capacity to deliver design and, and start implementing uh, programs uh, in order to raise the resources. So we need to be doing both. And uh, we're a little behind uh, for all the understandable and known reasons. Uh, COVID has made it all a lot harder to work. And let me add here a thanks to all of you who have uh, worked in places where the COVID thing is not so obvious and there's been a lot of obstructions of one kind or another and, and stresses. Uh, so thank you for all your commitment uh, on that. It's not easy at all. Um, COVID set us back. A lot of the cross-border works that we're trying to push uh, have high transaction costs. You know, that's not easy. So we know there's been uh, a lot of challenges. Uh, we really need to make a final push now in the, in the last two months. Uh, and really, it is only two months left uh, because by mid-December, you know, things start to close down on us. Uh, so really need to make a big push. Uh, and if, you know, you're bumping into uh, challenges uh, with your country teams, whatever, your resident coordinators, uh, you know, don't hesitate to uh, call us in. Um, we can uh, we can help by making phone calls and are encouraging and, and helping whatever way we can. But we really need to make a big push for that. And then next year, you know, we have an ambitious uh, five year strategy uh, and we need to keep going. And I, I think, you know, need to get a little bit creative. We need to keep doing what we're good at uh, and be a bit creative about uh, new ways um, that we can work on some of the peace building issues. And, and I think the common agenda, social contract prevention, cooperation frameworks, um, mainstreaming prevention somehow uh, are ways that uh, that we should uh, are, are issues that we should think about uh, to see if we can't uh, uh, expand even uh, expand even further and and do more good work out there. So lots going on. On uh, today's uh, uh, workshop, I guess it's a workshop. On today's workshop, uh, it is really important because the it is part of that train that everything needs to move in sync. Uh, it's got to be the design, uh, it's got to be the implementation, it's got to be the fundraising on my side. Um, but a linchpin between those things is the reporting. Uh, the reporting is the, the, is the accountability mechanism. Uh, every meeting I'm ever in with a donor is asking about results, is asking about impact. And, you know, it's complicated because if you just tell them an anecdotal story, they say, that's just an anecdote. So, you know, that's nice, but, you know, that's just one little story and, and, and you're programming you know, $200 million a year. If you just give them big picture numbers, they say, you know, you got to tell me a story because if you don't make it personal and tell me a story, then, you know, it's hard to see the connection. So it's got to be uh, a, a little bit of both. Uh, and it's why uh, I know it's frustrating in the design stage, but there's so much emphasis on getting the theory of change and the, and the log frame correct, because if we don't have that all there, then we can't put these pieces together to, to do the mixture of both the narrative personalized stories and the uh, formal reporting uh, against indicators and so on uh, that are so important. So the re this reporting piece, uh, really, I can't emphasize it enough and, and just, you know, very grateful in advance that you find the time to dedicate to this. Uh, I know it's hard because there's so many other pressures and so much else going on. Rest assured that we read every single report uh, that comes in. Uh, we try and give timely feedback to that. We certainly give feedback. Uh, uh, we try to make it as timely as, uh, as possible. And in all of those reports, uh, and, and this goes to, you know, when we're designing projects, our, our, our questions that often come back around the indicators and so on, but it's the peace building impact that we're always looking most for. So, you know, everybody understands that, you know, a peace dividends project and a conflict that affected area has, uh, has a huge uh, impact on, on peace building. I mean, it, it, even when people didn't have the language to articulate this 30 years ago, uh, they knew that that's what they were doing. They were investing in, in, a, in a geography that used to be in conflict and now can have access to services or whatever. We need to find ways to tell the stories about that connection to the peace building. We can't rest on the obvious assumption that people know it. 
we need to try to find ways through interviews, focus groups, perception surveys, uh, reporting on some of the indicators, whatever. When you're doing those reports, please always put yourself in my shoes. I mean, I can't do what you can do. So you've got to be me when you're writing that report and imagine in front of you, you know, the Norwegian or the Finnish uh, donor uh, who is trying to defend to their taxpayer, you know, why it's a good idea to make this investment and how it can contribute to peace. So really just keep hammering back on yourself and ask yourself that question. What is the what is the peace building uh, uh, connection? So that's it. Uh, uh, I really look forward to interacting uh, with all of you when we get into country specific portfolios. Uh, some of the names on the list uh, I recognize already and, and, and others not yet, but I look forward to getting to know all of you. Reach out uh, anytime uh, and you know, hopefully the world is opening up a little bit in some ways and we'll have a chance to uh, have some visits and get to meet some of you. So thanks very much. Sorry I was a bit long and uh, I guess Nagina back, uh, back to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Brian, for these great opening remarks. Um, and with that, I think we'll pass it to our presenters, Tammy Smith and Marcus Lindzen, who are senior advisors at the PBF. Um, and Marcus, let me know if you need me to help out with the slides or anything. Over. Thank you so much. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, evening, midday, wherever you may be. Uh, for me, also from New York, I'm uh, Marcus Lenzen. For those who haven't met me yet, I'm the senior advisor uh, in charge of strategy and partnerships and the deputy chief of the fund. So uh, together with Tammy, who'll introduce herself shortly, and many of you already know anyway, uh, we'll, we'll try to walk you through some of, as, as Nagina said, some some of the uh, sort of things we just want to drive home. There are a lot in our guidelines, but um, we know reporting can be onerous. We know a lot of you have a lot of these things to write and tend to have to do this under a lot of pressure. And yet we're going to try to invite you for all the reasons that that Brian just highlighted to take a step back and, and try to help you think a bit about it. Um, just to reiterate again how important it is as part of our accountability to donors, but also ultimately to beneficiaries uh, to think about are we are we achieving what we set out to do, what we set out to deliver for pe for the people that we're serving and um, and that it is ultimately a public record. Remember, all of these reports uh, go online and to the gateway and, and it's one of the big um, advantages of the peace building fund, right? That we there are not many instruments in the peace building sector where somebody who wanted to, even though the gateway is not the most user friendly tool, and yet if you wanted to, you could look at every single project that the peace building fund has ever funded since 2006 and find every single report on this. And that's because of the work that you're doing. Um, and what we're trying to do is just to help you you focus as much as possible as you either quality assure or actually write the reports yourself, right? Um, and as Brian said, we, we do read it. Uh, sometimes it takes us a little bit longer, but we go through every single report twice a year. We have a number of our program officers here, Nagina, the M&E team, we, we do read them. Um, and uh, because we do have to extract as much as possible, not just what's going on in the project, but to keep a bit of an eye across the board. You know, what are sort of the trends that are emerging, right? Uh, and our auditors read it. Yeah? We get audited regularly and they re don't read everything, but they do again uh, go and pick things out and, and go down. So even if you sit there sometimes think, who is ever going to read this? We, are, we do read it. And there's really important things in there that, that we try to extract. So, um, uh, I, Tammy, one thing I, I noticed, I think we don't have specifically on the slides later on. So one thing I wanted to, to lead with before I kick off with some overview things, basic things, is the scoring, um, you know, where you ask to self-assess whether you're on track, off track, or on track with, uh, you know, starting to see peace building results, you know, the, these bigger picture changes. And I'll, we'll come back to this perhaps as we talk about results and activity, but as you score yourself, it's just a reminder, I think, of a track. We, I often see reports that write a lot about their challenges, you know, that you invariably will encounter and yet uh, and have experienced delays, not least these days, pandemic times, etc. But curiously end up saying we're on track. 
And when we try to sort of assess this and we think, I, I, how can they say they're on track when so much is behind schedule and this, that and the other. And for us, the important thing is not so much, um, is it on track or off track? Of course, it matters. It's more the why. There may be all sorts of reasons why you're off track. We often invest in very high risk things. They may not be working out either. Again, pandemic happens. The political process doesn't uh, unfold as planned. Happens all the time. Um, other things, yeah, recruitment problems, etc. The important thing for us to know is what are you doing when it's off track? And um, and it may well be that we took a high risk with something and it just isn't working. And that's okay. I know you are always under a lot of pressure to so delivery, delivery, delivery. But for us and our donors, our donors often also ask us, but you know, you're investing in high risk things. It can't be that everything is always working well. They also want to help us tell stories where we learn from failure. So it's just an encouragement to say, it's okay sometimes to say I'm off track, but just tell us why, because it's also important for us to understand, right? So um, just keep that in mind as we go through uh, and what sort of some of the implications are of this. I'll, um, we'll stop every once in a while, you know, as you saw from the agenda, we have a bigger section at the end for Q&A, but um, if there's anything immediately that pops up, Nagina said she's moderating the chat, she'll stop us if Tammy and I go on too much, uh, put up your hands if, if those uh, who can uh, will, will gladly uh, break in between. Um, okay. With that, just a few basics, you know, that um, uh, let me go briefly on to the sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and there we go. Nagina, can you see this all right? Yeah, it's great. Thanks. Okay, so this is just a few basic things that. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, but uh, good to remind, right? We, the templates are on our website, which by the way, was just relaunched just uh, last Thursday. Uh, so we hope that a number of things are a bit easier to find and more up to date. Um, if Fatima and, and Habib, our communication specialist and, and our web designer newly joined from Niger, uh, uh, recently worked a lot on that. So the English and French versions are there. And the most important thing is that, you know, we just want you to please usually always go there uh, to get uh, and make sure you have the latest version of the templates. We do sometimes do updates uh, or, for example, based on frequent requests, we've unlocked uh, the word limits we introduced at some point um, because a lot of people said they just couldn't deal with that very well. But at the same time, we are still really pleading with you to, to, to respect the word limits we put in there. Usually, if you feel like you're writing lots and lots more, it starts to be information that's just not relevant for this, and it's a waste of time for a lot of us, right? So anyway, go to the website to always get the latest version of the template uh, is the message. Uh, as you know, the deadline for the end year report is always the 15th of November. Uh, all the project partners sign to this. This is an agreement we have, and you get the funding. So. Please respect that. This year it happens to be a Monday, and that's for both the narrative and the financial reports, right? So please, especially on the financial reports, please remember to attach the Excel budget annex with the column that shows the expenditure levels. We are very conscious this is completely uncertified. It's just to give us a sense where you at, but also for us to be able to check in a bit on the gender expenditure, right? Which, as you know, for the Peace Building Fund is a really important and key feature. And that we also really monitor very carefully because we make a lot of promises and a lot of our partners, you know, put a lot of trust in us that, that we hold this up. But again, we rely on you reporting accurately uh, on, on gender empowerment, uh, gender equality and, and uh, women empowerment uh, expenditures here. And then, of course, uh, um, uh, you need to upload both to the respective gateway, the narrative and the financial parts. Um, and sort of as a reminder, where we have PBF secretariats, you know, you are the secretariats are the first layer of quality assurance, right? And we sort of just ask that as you engage with teams and the teams sort of work together with the secretariat to plan feedback loops and any you know major follow up that are required preferably in time so that you can still upload the final reports on the 15th of November. 
I just want to iterate at this time of the year, it is so important for us that these reports are on time because Tammy leads our big annual report of the year, which is the Secretary General report on the peace building fund that has a very specific deadline. It has a very specific format. It's a report to the General Assembly. It is really important. And the more we slide behind the deadline, the more impossible it becomes for us to, to do this well. So really just a major plea to be uh, on time with this report, especially at the end of the year. Uh, of course, we don't have PDF secretaries in every country, in which case we do ask resident coordinator offices or often PDAs to help review reports and help with quality assurance in the first instance. A reminder that projects that have only uh, run for a few months, so in this year, it means projects that have started, meaning received their first tranche after the 1st of August in 21, you do not need to report yet on those projects uh, by the end of the year. The assumption is there will just be really too little to say in any meaningful way. But any project that has started before the 1st of August will be expected to have their first progress report in or, or end report if, if, if that's the stage of the project, of course. And then just again, another reminder on cross-border or multi-country regional projects. Remember that we ask those teams to have one joint consolidated report per project, but then upload that product separately into each country's gateway project page, right? It's That's for accountability and tracing purposes. But the point is that those projects need to have one consolidated report because it's a cross-border and we want the report to speak to the cross-border nature of the project's objective and do not report completely separately as if they were completely separate projects because that means to us usually this that the cross-border nature isn't working. Uh, and where we then have to majorly question sort of that investment. So that's just the overview of the main requirements and main timings um, that we want you to keep in mind. Um, and if uh, let me maybe briefly stop there if there are any um, questions about this before we go into more detail with Tammy in the next section. Is that all? No, I don't think any hands are up and I'm moderating the chat, so all good. In that case, um, Tammy, let me hand over to you for the next section. Great. Actually, Marcus, can you keep the PowerPoint yeah. up? I'll Thanks. Come back. <laughs> and then, yeah, I'll just sort of, I maybe it'll be obvious to indicate to the next slide. Um, but so Marcus was just walking us through like the deadlines and the reasons why. Um, I'm going to be talking more about like the the content. Um, so, you know, we're we want to focus today on really trying to get an understanding of what is the difference between like activity reporting and results reporting, and why is the results reporting the thing that we keep hammering home about? Um, and just the one caveat that I want to say, since Marcus was talking about those sort of deadlines. There's a line in uh, the previous slide that said if your project was uh, approved after August, you're not required to report. That's true. Um, and again, is it possible to mute everybody? I'm getting feedback. Sorry, Tammy, now you're muted. <laughs> because I clicked on mute all, it was easier. Thank you. Gotcha. Sorry <laughs> OK, so in recognition that, you know, some projects that were passed maybe in June or in, in July are really just getting going. So everything that we're going to be saying now about focusing on results and we want to talk about the peace building results, we realize that younger projects won't really be able to speak to that. It's only as the project matures that we get to that level. Um, but if you've been implementing for a year or for you know 18 months or 24 months, we're really expecting you to be able to kind of um, follow through on the principles that we're going to now be talking about. So in terms of do's and don'ts on activities versus results in on reporting, we want you to ask the so what question. 
So you're going to be looking into your work plans to see what happened in this past year. And you're going to see, oh, we held a workshop or a training for, you know, 50 police officers or 50 border officers um, to try to make them a little bit more, um, you know, uh, sensitive to uh, the, the, the communities or cross-border traders so that they're not kind of instigating tension. Okay, so you gave the, the training, that's great. But when it comes to reporting, we don't want to hear just that you trained people because that's kind of more like the input or even sometimes the output. What we care about is that you're asking, okay, we train these people, but so what? And the so what question then is, well, after training, they were then uh, doing their work in a way that actually was not raising tensions uh, or was creating better trust or confidence between those institutions and the population. That's the so what question. Um, we also want you focusing really on evidence and data to support your statements. So oftentimes we get in reports um, kind of really bold statements, which are great about the results, but they can be really oftentimes very unsubstantiated. So we want, we want to see like, what is the basis of how you know that thing happened? So as you're telling us about some really positive result, like in this context with the border guards that you're saying that they actually did contribute to um, greater confidence between cross-border traders and the border guards, What's your, what's your evidence for saying that there is this greater confidence? Um, so we want you to sort of be thinking about why am I able to say this? Like what kind of evidence or data do I have to support this? Um, and we also want you to be clear about who the project reach, um, where, how many, and in, in part this will help us understand the targeting of the project. Um, so are we reaching the right people? Uh, we're also going to be able to say something about then the scope of the project. So if it's just working with 15 people or 1500 people, um, that will really kind of say something also about the peace building effectiveness of the project itself. Um, and so we have also don'ts, which are sort of sometimes mirror images of the do's, but, um, you know, be, on the so what question, we were just saying with the border guards, like we don't really want to hear about the training. That's really top of the list on the don'ts. Those are really the trainings, the um, providing, you know, computers for local government offices that are newly established. These are really activities that you're doing that help support contributing to change. Um, we, we want you to, you know, know that you're doing those. Those will be built into your work plan. But when it comes to actually reporting, we want you to focus on that so what question. Um, and as we're looking at evidence, um, and we're saying like provide the evidence for the kind of results that you're talking about. One of the greatest weaknesses that we see is that some, like we will get just sort of a um, one anecdote about, you know, well, there was this one woman who said in the marketplace that she feels more confident in the border guards or that she doesn't feel nervous anymore going across and, and doing the sort of cross border training. I mean, it's great for that woman, but one person is not evidence. So let's sort of start looking for ways to try to generate actual data and evidence around what we're doing. And then we can use that one woman's great quote or story to kind of illustrate the point. But one quote or like one, one person's experience is not necessarily data. Uh, and then as Marcus was saying at the outset, really don't hesitate to report about the challenges or the un unsuccessful kinds of things that you tried. Oftentimes we are in a position uniquely as a fund to try to, to fund things that are high risk. Um, and by nature, something that is high risky probably has you know, a greater likelihood that not everything is going to work. Um, we want you to be clear and upfront with that. It's how we learn but also how we can work with you to maybe create like a, a different uh, revised or adapted approach. Um, we don't want to wait until we come to the final evaluation and look back and say, gosh, we, sh we had an opportunity to do something differently and, and something more effective and we didn't do it. We just sort of kept on keeping on with the same old thing. Uh, Marcus, next slide. Mark Marcus? Thanks. <laughs> so one way of thinking about 
what is sort of the difference between activities and results um, is if you kind of, I'm going to sort of map out this metaphor, like think about activities and the kind of inputs and the outputs, the training, the, the computers, the all this sort of micro stuff that you're doing, you can think of them kind of like Lego building blocks, right? They are essential, right? You cannot do your project without having these sort of essential building blocks, but they're not, you're not, implement, you're not implementing this project in order to just have a bunch of Legos kind of sitting on the floor. You're implementing the project in order to have each Lego build on itself to create a, a whole house or a whole structure. And it's that eye on that structure. So you're always going to be thinking, okay, I have these individual little elements here. Um, I have my training. I have this, uh, you know, networking opportunity to try to create better um, connectivity among women cross-border trainers uh, or cross-border traders. I have, you know, the facilitating like more um, robust institutions on the part of the cross-border people. So these are all the kind of little pieces of your project, but if they're all done as separate things, as separate Lego blocks, you're not going to see the sort of bigger picture. You're not going to also see the contribution that each of those little things has to building the greater kind of result, um, or in this case, the, the Lego house. So we always want you to think as you're, as you're about to sort of in your report, tell us about some training or uh, some other kind of input or output, think to yourself, why was I doing this? Like, what was the change that we ultimately need to see that was the basis for choosing this? And then report on the change, uh, not on the individual activity. Uh, next slide. Thanks. So we have a couple of examples. And here uh, we want to also open up for colleagues too. So we're going to kind of read through and then maybe get some responses back from some of you about your views about whether this seems like a good way of reporting or uh, if there is room for improvement. So the example one is the training of trainers for enhancing peace building competencies of 20 mentors took place in September 2021. During the reporting period, 1200, uh, 1200 of those 618 females have already been trained in peace building in the five targeted districts. So what do we think about if you if you were in our shoes uh, or in my shoes <laughs> specifically, I need to write the secretary general's report. I'm looking for ways of communicating the effectiveness of your pro of your work uh, within our report. Uh, does this help me tell that story? Uh, and if you think that it helps, then please unpack why you think it helps. If you think that there's room for improvement. Anyone? Don't be shy. OK, I see a hand up. I can't see who it is, but just unmute yourself and jump in. Hello, Tommy. Hi, John. Yeah, how are you? <laughs> Good. Yes. Good, to, good to hear you. Yeah. Okay. What do you think? Yes. I think this um, statement needs to be unpacked because it, it, it talks only of the training and not the change or the training led to. So this and, is the so what question. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so where, sorry, I'm going to push you a little bit now too. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, like we need to sort of ask the so what question about the training. If you were to then be uh, advising the the Runo or the Nuno who submitted this kind of thing in a report, what would you be going back and asking them to look for in terms of evidence? Like where might someone find evidence for the change? Well, um, I'll be asking them to show some evidence in the five targeted districts. So um, following the training, what change took place? Uh, are these uh, districts already, or these mentors, are they making some differences in terms of the training uh, uh, 
they they honor went. What are the applications? Okay, uh, are they applying the training uh, that the the actually uh, honor went? Uh, are they you know you know it's not yep. just about the training. Yeah. So these these will be some of the questions I'll be asking. And I just telling me about you know these mentors you know were training September. So what after the training? What happened? You know. Yeah. Um, so I'll be Fantastic. looking for those results. Yeah. Thanks so much. And John, I'm yeah. going to ask you, can you, mute, can you go back to being mute? Thanks so much, though. It was excellent. So mm -hmm. and with your answer, actually, you kind of give us two ways of looking at the impact or the, the result, right? One yeah. is when they go away from the training, are they able to use the principles or the new skills that they learned in the training? Are they applying them? So that's one way of going about trying to look at evidence or, or of results. There's an even greater effect, though, uh, which is if they are applying those new skills or like new way of working, is it having the intended difference that we were expecting, right? So maybe maybe they're they're actually really changed their behavior a lot, um, but it's not really making a difference in terms of reducing tensions in the community or creating better social cohesion in a community. Um, and that is also super important to know. It doesn't mean that their skills aren't good. Maybe it just means that the problem wasn't the lack of those skills. Maybe the problem is something else and then we need to kind of investigate that. So thank that was fantastic, John. Uh, can and we get Tammy, the next also slide? our Sorry, our colleagues yeah. from Uzbekistan are also typing in the chat that this is just one piece of information and bringing us back to the Lego example, just one Lego brick and not really showing the the overall impact of this individual activity. Absolutely in relation right. To others. Thanks, Thanks so on. much. Yes, yeah, and I can't see the chat, so like just chime in whenever something like that comes up. But yeah, exactly, spot on. Um, next slide. Okay, so example number two, let's read it. So by enabling youth from different communities to establish the practice of jointly addressing issues of shared interest, the project has contributed to overcoming conf conflicting and divisive narratives that inhibit social cohesion and inclusion societal factor. In practice, through its diverse initiatives tackling social, economic, cultural, environmental, and political issues through upshift, podium, ponder, conflict resolution training and programs, and UN Youth Assembly, the project has triggered structural changes by creating su uh, sustainable platforms for more than 4,000 young women and men in Kosovo working together to tackle society-wide issues. So what do we think about this example? Aside from that it's way longer than the other one. So come on, there are 61 people on the line. Surely someone other than just John is brave. Nope. OK, Alfred. I see somebody's hand is up. Yeah. Alfred. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good. Uh, hello, Taimin, and hello, everyone. Hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, well, uh, uh, I, I, I would like to say something about this example, too. Um, looking at the activities in the I stated my colleague on John. The activities, which is very simple. Yeah. The activities here is, I mean, they are targeting the youth. So. They are targeting youth for what? To <coughs> ensure social cohesion, taking into account other factors like political, economic, and uh, social. Now, once this training is done, to report the outcome or the impact of the activity, we need, we should be looking at what are some of the changes that not only the youth that we are targeted to train, but looking at the community as a whole. What is the impact of this training? What have to act? 
Yes, you're very much. This is a, at one level, the tensions have been reduced in the particular, I mean, target environment, and how cohesively the populations or the youth, including the other people that were not concerned, I mean, targeted by this training, have been coming together to resolve their problems. And once the training was about also to, I mean, for conflict resolution, we, we should also be looking at when, maybe before the training, we, we have some tensions in the community, and maybe the youth, you know, we are not uh, socially uh, <clears throat> coherent. Now, after this training, we should also be looking at how are they working together? And if they are working together, what are the changes are they bringing into the community? And who are the stakeholders involved into this work? Because we should also be talking about the other stakeholders involved. They, they train youth alone we highly bring a significant change for the whole community. So they should you know, be working alone you know, with other people, including their peers, and going beyond the community leaders, and as well as you know, women groups and as with other you know, women and youth groups. So we should, to gather this data, we, it is all, we need to check from all angles, looking you know, at the change that has occurred and who has involved in the change and what the individuals that are, you know, making the change is doing. So if we gather those, you know, information, we should be able to, you know, have a clear understanding of, you know, what has happened and what was the change, you know, that was brought yeah. because of the training and who are those involved. So, you know, it can also help us to, to better plan and maybe in the future and include maybe those that we thought, you know, we are not, you know, useful to bring the change. And maybe I have Gone too far. My colleagues are on the No, thank now. you so much. Yeah. No, it was great. So thank you so much. Because I think that the tendency would be to look mm -hmm. at the statement initially and say, yes, it is way better than the other one because the other one was just clearly about training and, and that was it. And this one is talking about structural changes and it looks really great. But if we begin to look a little bit deeper, right, we see that initially they say at the very top of the line, that the project has contributed to overcoming conflicting and divisive narratives that inhibit social cohesion, right? And the rest of, so, so as a person who's looking for results, I'm then looking for the evidence of being able to say, okay, we contributed to overcoming these conflicting and divisive narratives. What is the evidence for that? And we don't really see that here, right? Uh, we don't really see what it means to be overcoming the divisive narratives. Does it mean that, um, you know, kids are actually forming like cross communal friendships? Uh, are they fighting less? Um, is it just about the youth or is it also extending to communities as Alfred was noting? Um, but I think that I, this is a really great example, however, of um, I think a, a, a conundrum or a tricky thing that everybody faces because we have to also recognize that our projects are only 18 or 24 months, usually long, um, maybe in some instances like 30 months. And you have to ask yourself also, how far can we go? What kind of a, like a result can, is reasonable in 18 or 24 months? And so I think here, when we see at the very end here of the paragraph that the project has triggered structural changes by creating sustainable platforms for more than 4,000 young women and men in Kosovo. Okay, that's a that's a really nice result that in 18 months we have the sustainable platform. It is something that will continue beyond the, the life of this project through which young people from different communities can engage. So terrific. And, and if they had been a little bit more modest in their language about what they have been able to achieve, we could then say, okay, down the road, maybe in another six months or a year, we can come back and actually see whether or not these kinds of um, institutional changes that we have, have contributed to some other uh, kind of higher order change. So um, I think I, I do see some comments. I can't, again, can't see them. Uh, but I think in but the, maybe the largely of time. with you, Tammy. Sorry, they're saying that. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like a bit of a generic statement and yeah. vague. 
So yeah. Okay, and then just one last little bit to is, is that it's really gender blind because we, of course we have at the very end like more than 4,000 young women and men. So nice that they mentioned the difference, you know, that there were women and there were men, but it would also be really helpful to be able to see what the breakdown was. Um, and if we're talking about young people versus other kinds of stakeholders to also potentially see uh, the age cohorts and in this case, where we're talking about uh, different kinds of communities, break it down with the community so that we know, is it all just 4,000 from basically one kind of community that's participating in this, or is it really getting at that kind of exchange? So we really have to think critically about the kind of words that we're using to describe our results. Um, can we go to the next slide? Thanks. So at this point, I'm going to pass you back over to Marcus, who will talk more specifically about gender, uh, COVID, and catalytic results. So thanks very much. All right. So um, we're into the section of a few things that we pay these days very particular attention to. And just uh, because Nagina reminded me, somebody asked earlier in a chat um, to confirm whether there had been any recent changes to the project reporting template. Since I mentioned, please always go to the website to make sure you have the latest version since we do sometimes update. So just to say that there aren't any recent changes, but even in the June reporting exercise, we noticed there were still a number of project partners who used older versions that, for example, didn't have the COVID-19 section that we introduced last summer in 2020. So it's more a matter of making sure that your program partners are indeed not using versions from before the summer of 2020. And if in doubt, use the version that is on the website. Yeah, that, that was the main one of the main introductions. And the other thing that we had at some point done is uh, unlock uh, the, the, the word limit blocks because of various feedback we received. Uh, if, if some people still have a version that has a locked section, I mean, in the end, that's fine because for us, it was always the point of making sure they don't go overboard with the text. But but uh, just so just to confirm that that's that's the change. So the, it's, if, you, if they're already working on it, the main thing to make sure is that the COVID-19 section is, is actually in there. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So a few things, you know, that we said in the beginning, we we pay very particular attention to and that, that sometimes gets uh, a bit short shrift in reporting gender dimensions, um, the catalytic effect part of the fund COVID-19 now. So a few things I want to highlight to you. This is mostly a bit of a do and don't. Um, and again, in in terms of starting, I just wanted to ask, you know, into the group, into the virtual space here, when it comes to reporting about gender sensitive peace building, as you know, this is a key feature of the fund. Uh, we we pride ourselves in in being the fund in the system with a highest level of ambition of having at least 30 percent of all our investments dedicated to gender responsive peace building we we typically have had at least 40 percent but of course making the case that that's actually true report depends a lot again on how you report right it's the gender budgeting part uh and and it's it's about uh, how you then actually reflect what gender sensitive approach has meant can I just ask into the room, if you think about do's and don'ts of things that you do, if you're writing reports or if you're a secretariat member um, that you tend to see, what is one thing that you say, this is a really good practice that I always try to do to ensure gender sensitive reporting or uh, conversely, feel free to also say something that you say, this is something I often see or, or do that is really not good practice. Can I just ask into the room who wants to share one or two points that you care about and you think are important to make sure reporting is gender responsive? And very important thing, a lot of us should be doing this all the time. Don't be shy. Come on, people, it's a major commitment of the United Nations. <laughs> uh, John. John Dennis again. 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Magus. <laughs> good okay, to hear. Uh, yeah. So first thing first, to ensure that uh, to ensure gender reporting or gender sensitive reporting um, um, uh, is ensured. First, uh, during the development of the project, what we try to intend, what we, what we what we intend to do in most cases is to make sure that the indicators are disaggregated by gender, if possible or where possible. So doing reporting, it makes it easier to track uh, what the partners are reporting. Take for example, if uh, you have uh, your target of maybe 50 persons that you want to reach out to. And if you don't make sure during the formulation of the project that your target has, for example, 50% gender, uh, then it makes it difficult doing the reporting. But even at that, if it is not clear from the very beginning, when you are reporting, when the agencies are reporting, what we try to do is to go and ask further questions. So of the 50 persons, 100 persons you are targeting, how many of those are women, for example? How many, how many activities are geared towards you know, addressing the issues of GWI? You know, so on the basis of that, we, we they normally come back to us with clear, you know, um, activities or interventions that address the issue of gender or Jew in general. So yeah. um, it, John, again, great. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you there just because I had another hand. So gender disaggregation, and I'm, we'll come back to that very important point. Yes, Greece, I saw your hand go up briefly. And since you have the camera on, you get also gender. Thanks, John. Over to Madagascar. Yes, thank, yeah, thank you, Marcus. I think one of the key points for uh, for gender reporting is also the, the project drafting moments. Uh, because when we are drafting the project, uh, usually UN agencies, RUNOS or NUNOS say, OK, we'll have a gender marker. You know, we'll have spend 90% of the budget uh, for, for gender. But actually, what we're trying to do, or what we tried to do, to do la the last time we drafted projects, is to have a clear um, shadow budget uh, on gender on gender budgeting. We had some sessions with uh, gender specialists in order to see how we can uh, do some uh, gender budgeting. And uh, we, achieved, we arrived at a more reasonable, uh, more realistic uh, amount, uh, amount of project uh, for gender. And we, when we, we do the other exercise when uh, reporting, it's a bit difficult and it's the most difficult part from my side uh, to have UN agencies uh, following the, those numbers, those, uh, those tracks. That's it. Thank you, Marcus. Thanks, Breeze. No, it's it's true. This isn't easy, uh, but um, I think it's an important uh, point to raise. You know, and why we we pay so much attention to it, right? We we introduced the gender marker some years ago, um, and and we've been trying in the more recent years to be. You know, we have issued a lot more guidance on gender budgeting, and we look much more now because at the end of the day here money matters right it is a matter of saying not just to say we had lofty ambitions uh and we're going to disaggregate a bit how, who we monitor who participates in certain things but to say are we making sure that a, a majority of our investments is targeted in particular ways and as you know our gender budgeting guidance tries to help a bit with that and so this matters at the design stage but it matters also here because again sometimes it's possible that you cannot do what you wanted to do and then it's in the first instance that's okay but reflect on why that is right and we may well be in a position that we have to downgrade the gender marker of the project but of course in the first instance we would say what more can you do to keep it at the gender marker where it was supposed to be right but but again it's about evidence and and since we we make this a really big priority and we know globally it remains such an underfunded issue that for us, for this fund, when you're using peace building fund resources to keep this really high on, on your priority list and to look at, well, how do we know whether this happening really matters to us? So in the interest of time, I really am just going to uh, build on some of the things you already had, right? And of course, you have later uh, um, the summary of it, right? So one thing here is is, again, to be sure that in the reporting, it's about describing ultimately the experience of, of uh, how how um, how both different genders, men and women, but also in their age groups, younger and older men and women experience conflict and peace differently. 
and how these groups have challenges and opportunities that are different, right? And to, which usually is something we would have asked you to spell out in your conflict analysis. And then we hope that you also still reflect that on in, in the reporting, right? And it's important that we see here the, in, the, in your analysis that that is a reflection about the positive and negative aspects that that interventions have uh, on on uh, women uh, and men, but also young and old. Again, you heard John make the point about the disaggregation of data. Usually, we will have paid a lot of attention to this in the design of your M and E uh, frameworks. And again, this is the point where we hope that that you present that data as you collect it through the monitoring approaches of the projects. And one important thing is really because often we still fall back in reporting to this extremely basic point of um, saying just, well, we were gender sensitive because we made sure that X number of women uh, or young people participated in the exercise, right? And for really this whole thing about gender response of peace building is to go beyond counting how many women participate in an activity, right? But rather on what your analysis would have said, what their needs or roles are, and reflect now on the reporting of whether or not or to what extent they've been addressed uh, at the point of reporting. And of course, that depends a lot on what stage the new project is in, about how far reaching that may be. Um, but still, that's that's the main thing we're, we're interested in here. Um, and again, uh, here, the, Breeze was talking about it, not so easy, but you know, uh, we do look at the amount spent. You made certain commitments in that regard. We, we count this, so we report it, but then also provide a narrative explanation of this, right? Especially when it was lower than expected, right? Again, that may happen, but, but say why it is and, and whether you can mitigate against it over the remainder of the project period. Um, and then on the don'ts, right? So it's it's sort of similar, you know, what we try to already address when you design projects, you will hear is often give feedback to projects that lump women and youth somehow together and say it will be, you know, gender sensitive by including women and youth. And we say you need to break this down, which women, which youth, which age groups and which populations groups, et cetera, and keep reflecting here as well about experience of different groups and, and not lumping. So don't lump them together, which we unfortunately still see. Same thing, you know, if, if they do pertain to different communities, rural, urban, different ethnicities, religious, whatever it may be in your context, do not treat women as a monolithic group. We still see that too often uh, when we know for sure that this is there's not just one group of women um, th that makes it really difficult to to kind of ascertain uh, how gender responsive this actually is. And then again, do not report on gender sensitive approaches only as women focused outcomes, outputs, activities. So no matter what results level we're talking about, gender sensitive approaches about recognizing, capturing how a project can affect women and men differently, right? Um, and not again, just counting how many women participated in activity. So we unfortunately still see this often in projects is what we're bringing it up and it's the strong encouragement to, to, to go beyond that in, in your reflections um, and of course in the actual implementation of, of the project. Um, catalytic effects. Um, I'll, um, who ventures, who ventures uh, forth uh, a definition of what does the, um, uh, I'll see some questions coming in which I look at, but as I look at the questions in the chat, um, Catalytic effect. As you know, the Peace Building Fund is a fund that says it is flexible, uh, responsive and catalytic. It's a very important feature of the Peace Building Fund. It's one key niche and comparative advantage that our donors also want to hold us to at all times. So can anybody volunteer? How do we tend to define catalytic? How do we try to measure that in projects? How do you usually reflect on catalytic effect of a project? Who'd like to share some reflections? Margarita, I don't know you, Margarita Vivas. I just saw your uh, sound briefly flare up. Is this a tentative assuming of the mic? Okay, I think I failed to put you on the spot here. <laughs> Uh, hi. Go ahead, please. 
Yeah, yeah, it's a mom from Mauritania. I am Mauritania. So catalytic effect can be, uh, as you, you mentioned, that uh, maybe uh, it allows some or it brings some other donors to fund similar projects uh, that was funded by the uh, PBF, but also it can be uh, some results that uh, uh, push some other region or other countries to develop the sim similar activities or similar projects. Very good, thank you. That's a very concise and, and clear summary of that. Uh, Alfred, I see your hand up. Yeah, um, I think I, I have something or similar to say as compared to what that colleague from Montana have just stated. You know, talking about the catalytic, I mean, catalytic effect, it is in, in two ways. It could be programmatic and also financial. Yeah. Well, to, to, to define it briefly, uh, I would say it is a way, it is a particular way the project, you know, has influenced other actors or donors. It could be the communities or other partners out of the, you know, the, the, the intervention community to grow, to better understand the, the intervention in question, its result impact and then be motivated to to contribute towards the work in, initiated by the project and it could be in this way maybe another partner has you know seen us doing something that is really making a change a significant change you know for the people we target then maybe that partner may may see it as interesting and then say wow we might you know Implicate, I mean, uh, do the same thing on our own, or let us contribute to the work undertaken by our colleagues. And so most often we have, you know, other donors coming in to, to give money to our partners, you know, to implement similar activities either in the same communities or in different communities. That is, you know, financial. It could also be programmatic, you know, people copy from our results. They look, you know, how the kind of impact those results are making for our target beneficiaries and how could they also be in, I mean, implemented in other communities who are in it so we, we 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 might think of doing the same thing or in, in different way so maybe i don't want to go for yeah it, it is a way that you know people see the impact on of the particular projects and then contribute Perfect. willing later yeah, to do let me let me also stop you. So great, we've had uh, it, Breeze gave us another way of putting it that we're talking. We're looking here for snowball effects, right? Sort of what happened after, preferably in the scale up. Now, not every project is looking for a scale up, right? Sometimes you're the project is very time bound for a very particular thing in a very particular moment in time, and you're not you didn't design the project uh, to be scaled up and mobilize lots more money and this kind of stuff, right? But they may still have this process oriented, right? And there are dues here, we distinguish between the financial and process or uh, um, way um, that you try to do, right? At that very moment, or we talk often about an unblocking of process, right? The project was time bound, but it was there for a very particular thing. Get a national dialogue, you know, going uh, at the time. And then, so the question is, was the project able to respond in a timely manner into to, to get this national dialogue going? Uh, for example, even if afterwards there isn't anything else. But other projects were designed to try out something, to test something, to pilot something, to get something going. And that's what the Peace Building Fund normally is there to, to do, right? Um, and whether that's a global program, like I think we had colleagues here from Salient, the Small Arms and Life Saving Institute, which is also trying to mobilize more funding on the basis of this or, or in country, all the examples you gave, right? And I know that in particular, the financial thing is not easy. A lot of the countries where we have PBF secretariats, they do follow up a lot with teams to kind of get additional information. Um, but it is really a plea for projects to think about. And we've, we've given guidance in the past to think about the financial side between direct and indirect, right? Direct is anything that where you are running a project and you've actually been able to mobilize more resources following or you know during 
a PBF uh, investment where you have other donors joining the same initiative or where you already know that you've been able to start to kickstart other initiatives on the back of it, but that were directly related, right? And then the indirect part is the thing where it isn't necessarily money that came directly into the same project that the PBF is funding, but where we started working in, an, in a thematic area, let's say it was about um, durable solutions for displaced populations in a particular region of a country, and the PBF intervention was one of the first ones to do so. And then, you know, during the life cycle of the program, and of course, sometimes it's only after, maybe you pick it up in the evaluation, right? Um, when the project is already over, you have other initiatives that started where you could say, well, it wasn't a direct resource mobilization, but we were still the first ones and we helped bring attention to this area, et cetera. And then, you know, we, we count, we can still count this as an indirect uh, catalytic effect, right? So, and we talked here a bit about process orientation, you know, and have a few examples here of, of what that might look like is unblocking or a change. And, and colleagues have just already given a number of examples uh, in your, your thing. And in, again, in the project templates, right, if you run out of space where you want to describe a bit more the catalytic effect, just to say there is an other box underneath the catalytic effects financial section where you can go into a bit more detail as well, just to point out that that's possible there. And then again, just a few don'ts here. You know, we, what we often see is people, uh, they try to put some monetary amount in and then they say, you know, I don't know, $2 million, but they don't say anything else. So we don't know who was this from, what was this for, when did this happen, right? Was this, uh, so we really, in order for us, for us, for this to be useful, we need a bit more information uh, about this, right? And the thing is that it is one of the key things we need to report back to other donors. The investors in the peace building fund ask, well, how many, how much more money did you catalyze? How many processes did you help unblock? And so this is for us a key way to try to capture this, right? So again, the plea there for to be, to, to not be vague about what was mobilized from which source and, and be as, as clear and transparent as possible. Um, let me just sort of then briefly stop so that uh, uh, we'll finish with this section is on COVID adjustments. So, you know, we introduced this, as I said earlier, last year. Um, we're still monitoring this. We still get questions uh, from donors about what the Peace Building Fund had done. You will remember we had discussions with a lot of the PDAs, the resident coordinators, the PBS secretaries early in the pandemic to be clear about what is needed from a peace building perspective. How can the peace building fund potentially contribute to the UN's common COVID response? You know, there's a particular niche we see for the fund. The fund, we got questions at the time. There were a lot of needs, of course. You know, can you help? Can we use our project funds to buy ambulances? They urgently need ambulances or whatever. And where we have to say, no, sorry. You know, that there are other funding sources for the life saving and health oriented part of it. You know, if, um, but there are peace building dimensions. You know, we broke them down into five categories. And we're still asking you to reflect. We introduced a specific section in the report to reflect on this. Right, so the first <laughs> plea is do fill out this part. It's part four of the temple. You know, it, it, it's asking about whether you made any monetary adjustments, or whether you made non-monetary adjustment. It didn't cost you anything else or different, but, you know, you still had to do certain things. Um, and then we have the five categories uh, of, of what we see as the fund's niche in this regard. And we ask you to select up to two. Uh, of the boxes, is to, uh, we have a sense of what kind of thing the project is does was a crisis response, social cohesion, uh, etc. Um, we ask you to also do provide a substantive narrative, yeah, um, re regardless of whether you reallocated budget uh, to this, right? Remember that you can make any project can make budget changes up to 15% between outcomes or budget categories that you don't need to come to us to sign off on. If, um, but it, you know, we want just to know when when it's done, and if it's COVID related in particular, do reflect it here, you know, so that we have a better sense uh, at an aggregate level 
to what extent um, the projects that we're funding made and keep making adjustments uh, uh, to COVID-19. And of course, if you're making any major adjustments, especially if they go above 15%, remember you would need to come to us beforehand for for a, um, to get an approval of a, of a major revision. But uh, we we have mostly seen this to be, you know, in, within the realms of what project can do themselves anyway, without seeking clearance from us. But we'd still like to see. And the important thing again is to keep reflecting on how does this whatever you did in the project, how does it respond to the peace building dimensions of COVID nineteen, right? Um, if we start then seeing that PBF resources will start to be used more for our health uh, issues, et cetera, then of course we would have to say, I'm sorry people, but that's not what you should be using these funds for. Um, so, and then, so similarly, there's a very basic, do not leave this port empty. Even if you didn't do anything, say it, right? Just say we didn't, it didn't matter for us. We didn't have anything that needed, required us to change anything. Um, but at least we know that you thought about it because we had too many project reports that left this empty or, as I said earlier, didn't uh, use an older template and didn't have the section in it. And then we don't know that you just skip the section or is it really that it wasn't relevant? So again, please do say something. And again, the reminder about which project to use. Um, Marcus, we have a if I may, maybe in COVID, but we, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm just being conscious of time that we didn't yeah. even finish the presentation yet. Um, but we'll be sharing the slides. Examples. So just to say that when we send you this thing out, we have a number of examples from colleagues here uh, for you to look at about what kind of things they presented, right? So when you see this, you'll have a few more ideas of, of what some of the other projects did and how they presented it. Um, that's it for me. Thanks very much. So that's my cue. Uh, yeah, Marcus, can we have the slide back up again? <laughs> Sorry about that. So dear colleagues, many of you have been asking questions um, in chat about the closing projects and the different uh, requirements for final report versus annual versus evaluation. So Tammy will briefly go into that and then we'll pass it for a few minutes to our MPTFO colleague um, and then remaining time will be for questions. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll just try to touch just very, very briefly on like there have been a, actually a lot of questions, as Megini just said, between final reports and annual reports versus evaluation. So when to know which one to do. Uh, so, you know, with final reports, because it really should be wrapping up the sum total of everything that you've been doing, we're expecting a kind of greater focus on the highest level change that your project was seeking. Um, and ideally, these final reports are going to be able to pull from and benefit from an evaluation. So uh, if, if some of the questions were, you know, I'm going to, my project is ending in December this year, so it's kind of coming up soon. Should I do a final or a, uh, an annual? The question back to you guys then would be, do you feel that you have wrapped up sufficiently the bulk of the implementation and are starting to see evidence through evaluation, through project monitoring at that higher level result that you can speak to? Because this is your last chance to communicate your results to us. So regardless of whether it is a final or um, an annual, every project must submit and upload to the gateway um, an independent final evaluation within three months of the project end date. So in order to do that, you know, you could have like your project ending in December and then you'll have until the end of March actually to um, submit the final evaluation and the final report. Um, project teams, however, if you're going to use that three month buffer after, you must commit the evaluation budget prior to the project end date. So that's kind of a critical little piece of information. So don't wait until you're in that three month buff buffer period. You have to obligate the money before. And just bear in mind, and we can do a separate um, uh, webinar on this, but PBF quality assures all evaluation documents, including the TOR. So if you're planning an evaluation, reach out to us. As Marcus said at the outset, projects, um, uh, sorry, no, uh, our, our deadlines are uh, 15 June and 15 November. If your project uh, was ending between this period, so the 15 June to 15 November, 
you must submit some report. It can, as we said before, it could be the final report or the annual report, but you have to receive, you have to submit one of them so that we can report on your results. Um, and for projects, again, ending after November 15, you have the choice of which one you do. Next slide. Thanks. So just um, to touch briefly, and we again will be sharing uh, this slide pack so you can refer to it. And at the very end of the bullet points here, you also see that we have included a link to a guidance note on how to close projects. But just to touch base really quickly on the requirements for closing projects, we need, as we said, the evaluations to be uploaded to Gateway. Um, for the uh, CSOs among you, um, you are required to do an independent audit uh, and to send that to your designated PDF um, focal point. Um, we also then need, in order to close the project, we need to have received the final report and that same PDF focal point will review the report, check it for to make sure that it is reporting on these higher level results and not just on um, uh, on activities that it's clear on the sort of gender responsiveness um, that we have seen things around the catalytic nature and if it is acceptable in terms of the the content of the report then the pbf officer will signal to gateway will send a message to the mptfo um, that this report is considered to be final it's approved um, and with that, the MPTFO will shift over in from, it, it will operationally close the project um, and then begin the process with your headquarters offices to go through financial closure and initiate financial closure. Um, and again, I put, or we put the, um, the link to the guidance note on project closure at the bottom of uh, this slide pack. It's also available if you just Google it. <laughs> it's, it's pretty clearly uh, clear to find. Um, and I think that's it from my side. Nagina, back over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. And I think we can stop sharing the slides. And Farnas, who is our colleague from MPTFO, is now able to present and share her screen for the MPTFO intervention. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you to PBSO colleagues and Nagina. I'm going to start sharing my screen. And let's see, here we go. Okay. So here what you have in front of you is the gateway, which is the repository for all the documents under the PBF projects. Really, the Peace Building Fund is the richest in terms of documentation. So there is a lot there. Um, I'm going to also mention that if you ever need to write back, it's something that's sent out to all our country editors, and I want to thank them. So because this is why the Peace Building Fund on the Gateway is so rich with documentation, because the country editors have been uploading the reports. So. One of the places you can to go here is learn about Gateway. And if you go there, this is where you can find guides on navigation as well as how to upload. So you have quick guides, tools for searching, how to use document center, and here to enter submit a narrative report. So this is available to you. Now going back to the main page and the peace building fund. Actually, before I do that, let me just go here. If I want to get in general crossing all funds, there's the document center. So the gateway allows for multiple ways of navigating to things. I can put here peace building fund. And this would give me the list if I said find documents of all the documents across all the projects, including at the fund level. And if I wanted to look for something, this keyword search allows you to put in something. So let's say I want to put in gender. 
This would then give me a list. So this page is also useful if you want to look for reports at a higher level. So across the entire Peace Building Fund. And as you can see, I've put in gender here. The document does not have gender in the name, but it is in the project description. Um, and here, for example, it's not in the project description, but it is in the title of the report, and that's why this shows up. So just to show that the filtering allows you to put things in, including if you entered that into a separate description field. So I'm just going to go over a little bit about what your options are. And here you can pick again, you can filter by country um, and by type. So if you were looking just for a final report or end of project report that referred to gender in some way, you would be able to find that. You can then also, by the way, download this into an Excel and work with that. Or if you wanted to also do filtering by date, you can do that. You can filter and say, I want to see everything from January 1 of this year through October or the end or for the last two years. And how do I apply that? Do I want it for the document date or do I want it for an upload date? So this is a little bit about this. And now going back to the Peace Building Fund. Yeah, so this was just an example. If colleagues are interested to see how other uh, colleagues in different countries uh, submit their reports, this is one way of finding all the documentation that other colleagues submit. Yes. Thank you. So here on the Peace Building Fund and the page, um, you will see the higher level. And again, you can always sort through things, um, all the countries, projects by country will tell you. So um, now I'm going to go a little bit more into um, the project page. I've picked one in particular just to, not one, but just to give you an idea, description Pardon? of the... Yes. Yeah, sorry, this is Tammy. I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm conscious that we are down to yes. the end of the time and people are also in other parts of the world. Okay. Can you, the thing that's going to be most important for them uh, at this point is project, like the document uploading. Okay. Can you just okay. walk them through that? I think that would be super helpful. Okay, what I will do is because I found that over 90% of the editors can upload, so the upload process is not the issue. What may come up, and this is what, if it's okay with you, would like to focus on are some of the issues that may come up, but it's not the upload itself. So upload has always been, in fact, I've never had anyone give me a question about that in particular, but there have been issues with, let's say, how do I uh, log in or if I have problems logging in, or for example, the date. So here we have nine documents. Here we have 10 documents and more. So because the most recent one only will show up, you would have to go back and look for any prior reports under the documents here. But what I can do as well now is just I'm going to show you. Um, here I've logged in. And I'm going to show you when you actually upload what your options are. So here's the record that's already been uploaded just to recommend. Here's your report. You've chosen the file. You have an option here to put an additional description to what you have under here, and this will then be picked up by the gateway. Um, the issues that have come up, they will be sometimes a question of access. So a question of access. This is I will try and do that in the next couple of minutes. When you put in your name, always uppercase X and then the password. The system, if you do three times and log in and you don't remember the password, or for some reason the combinations are not the ones that are registered, the system will, won't will let you um, get in and will give you a message. So in that case, please do send me the message and the screenshot because that's very helpful since there may be more than one reason why that access is blocked. Sometimes it's a question of not having been there over the last six months, and that would be a different reason. So we use a different system to unlock it, and then I contact the security colleagues who can help you do that. So the important message here for me is, please let me know what message you get if it's an access issue. Um, aside from that, then in terms of uploading, as I said, if you put, you can put an additional description to what is here, 
and that will then help you because when you're doing the request, I'll show you. So for example, if you look something up, if an entry has been made under the description, like here you can see, it will show up. Um, I know we're running late, so I think what would be very helpful is if at some point you think there's an interest, I would do a maybe half hour session. I think 20 minutes is more than enough to go over any issues that our colleagues have found they've encountered. We compile them and we go over them in that session because I understand that there isn't enough time and you want to end. In fact, supposed to have ended at 10.30. So um, I will then give that back to you because that might be a better way to approach this. Um, yeah, that would be awesome, yeah? actually. OK, yeah. why don't we do that? And this might be, uh, well, yes, OK. Well, thank you very much. No, thanks so much. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, apologies that uh, time ran over. But Nagina, back to you. Sorry, our mistress of ceremony. <laughs> No, thanks very much, um, everybody. Thank you for us. And sorry we didn't have a lot of time. Uh, but colleagues, in the presentation slides that we will be sharing, there is um, a link to the guide from Gateway that kind of discusses step by step how to upload documents to Gateway. And if you do encounter any problems uh, with the upload, please let us know. And I'm sure we can put you in touch with Parnas and other colleagues who can help out. Um, with that, I think uh, those of you who can stay for a few more minutes, if you have any questions, please raise your hands, pick it up. I see um, if there are any more questions in the chat, I trust colleagues can also respond in writing. Um, and there is a hand from John. Yes, OK, thank you. Uh, one question to Fernandez. Uh, how do you edit uh, when a document is uploaded? I found it very difficult to do that. So sometimes if we, um, once you um, upload the report and in time, and then you find out that there is something that you need to edit, you have to delete again and, re and, and, re or, and, mm. and upload again. It gives a different date, like the report was uploaded late. So how do you address that? Okay, so in that case, you go back to your page, and when you go to that page, you're going to see a whole list under that page. You click on the record you want to change. So let's say you want to change this one. Oh, let's try here. <laughs> I think because it's 15 minutes if I haven't logged in. Let's say if you want to change this, you would go back to that record and then make that edit there. So I can show you now. Let's try this one. So I think it was 119443. My, my uh, menu may be just a little. Longer than what you would normally see on yours. So let's say I, I uploaded this and I want to change either the description. I go back to the record rather than deleting it because one of the things about deleting would mean pretty much that you don't want that record up at all, but you can go in and edit something. It's a great question, thank you. And you can, let's say you've made a change to your report. You can just re, um, yeah. So let's say a current document, load a new document. Mm. Yeah, see what you mean. What you can do is make changes here, right? And then save it. So now here we go. Show all files. Go. That's where it is. It's been a while since I've had to do this. No wonder. So basically, I would just go in, show all files, and then upload whatever I needed to do. I'm not going to save this record, but that would replace then my existing record. You see, if I were to uh, do that. And then you would see this. It's it's here, even though it's not there yet because I haven't saved. So I've chosen a new file. I can make edit changes here. And if I were to click on save, this then new document would 
would show up, but with the same link. So if you had sent that link previously to to people around, that link would still remain to that report. But let's say you've updated it or you made a correction and you can do that. And if I were to click save now, it would just show the original. And then again, it would have a date time change showing my name. So um, I, I hope that was clear. But uh, if you do have any yeah. questions, please do send them to me and I think that would be helpful. I can either um, do a short presentation and go over it or try and put them together in a kind of document and send them out. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful. And then once we have that consolidation of FAQs and kind of the guides, yes. we can share it with our uh, community of practice listserv. Thank you. Um, I see colleagues are asking some questions in writing and those questions which have not yet been addressed or you want to clarify, please do speak up. Okay, then I don't see any hands that are up. Um, I believe we will remain here for a few more minutes on the line. Uh, those of you who still want to discuss something with us, otherwise, Thank you very much, dear colleagues, for your time. Um, hope you'll, you found it helpful and we'll be following up with you in writing with the presentation slides and the recording. Thanks very much. Yeah.